the Jay Johnstone Show. Join Jay and his guests, Dodger catcher Steve Yeager, Orioles and Angels third baseman Doug Desense, and Angels perfect game pitcher Mike Witt. And now here's a guy who played Major League Baseball for 20 seasons and 87 teams. He's got four World Series rings and wrote three best-selling books all about it. Now, here's Jay! Hi, everybody, and thanks for watching. And we've got a great show for you tonight. We're here at Legends in Long Beach, the granddaddy of all sports bars. And by the way, the official home of the Jay Johnstone Show. Hey, folks, don't go away, because I've got Steve Yeager, Doug DeCincy, and Mike Witt coming right back. everybody and thanks for watching. My first guest, Steve Yeager, one of the most popular Dodgers in Dodger history, one of the best defensive catchers and the 1981 World Series MVP. And my second guest, Doug Desense, a career of 237 Major League home runs, an all-star, 15 years in the big leagues, and my third guest, Mike Witt, another 15-year Major League veteran, an all-star, and the 11th man in the history of baseball to ever throw a perfect game. How about that? Steve, what? that face mask, remember the, when the injury, tell us how that came about. You developed something that was really special and saved a lot of catchers. Well, we, uh, I got hit with a broken bat off of Billy Russell in San Diego one night, and uh, I, saw, I saw him hit the ball, it was a broken bat, ground ball to shortstop. So I bent over and tried to get that donut off the bat, and it stuck, and I'm beating on it, and all of a sudden it goes off, I come up, and next thing I know I'm laid out. So they operate on me and got... Uh, nine pieces of splinter and they wouldn't let me play until I got the stitches out. I mean, that was really close to your juggler, wasn't it? Well, you know, I've had two, you know, they say a cat has nine lives. I've had two. I had a car accident last year, and so I've used two of them. No, that one in the car accident. You got a so few more. I got seven left. I think you've used a few more. No, no, no. I've never gotten hurt jumping from a second story at any time in my life. <laughs> what so about Steve, Steve? That went right through your throat? No, it went right in here and popped right out. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. I thought it was... Implanted. And it was no, just, it was, a, it was the part of the bat, the bat head? It was the barrel. The, the barrel, barrel of the bat. Well, you know, the, when we played, bats didn't explode like they I, do today. They, I, I mean, have. very seldom did a bat come apart and fly through wow. the air when we, when we were playing. And like today, it's, it's basically, it's like they got the TNT on the end of a barrel. Yeah. I mean, you had a brand right. new bat hit it on the sweet spot and it blows up. Right. But it went flying through the air and I dug down to put that ring off of there and it came back up to, to walk. Cody Russell wow. was out. I mean, he used Boston wood anyway. So, you know, yeah. and, and next thing I know, and boom, it's there. Yeah, but people you, say, people say, why, why, why didn't you see it coming? What if I saw it coming, I ducked. But wait a minute now, after that, then you came up with a device to save that from happening to Bill, catchers. Bill Bueller and I came up with, with uh, they call it a turkey gobbler. Uh, Willie Stargell told me to put my tongue back in my mask and all that stuff. <laughs> and we came up with it, and it is mandatory at, uh, for Little League, and a lot of guys still use it. Uh, it's, it was made uh, right here in Los Angeles uh, with uh, my signature on the back of it. And we got quite a few on the market, and I've gotten letters over the years that saying thanks for the throat protector because it, it saved uh, an injury to my, my son. And the last thing you want to do is get hurt and say, Mom, I don't want to catch anymore. And that's exactly what happened. So any type of equipment that you can get in any sport that, that stops a kid from getting injured, I mean, uh, you know, it's great. And if I, if I remember by, by the turkey gobbler, I'll take it. That's fine with me. Rumi, the best defensive catcher of your time. I mean, that's got to be a thrill to get an honor like that. Um, tell me a little bit about uh, why you became such a great defensive catcher. Because I couldn't hit. <laughs> <laughs> that's, one way. that's one way to stay in the big leagues, that's for sure. <laughs> You're either an offensive catcher or a defensive catcher, so I was a little bit of offense and a whole lot of defense. But postseason, I did pretty good, though. You did. Yeah. 1981 World Series MVP. Got to Pretty give you good. Credit. Well, that ain't bad. No, that ain't bad. I'll no, tell that's, you. That's that's how it's I, I got I got a little hits every now and then. I just saw saw a few pitchers throw their glove up in the bottom of the ninth with a walk off. <laughs> but we didn't call them walk off. We just beat you. You know. Yeah. <laughs> Mike, um, the 11th Major League player in the history of baseball ever to throw a perfect game. Uh, your thoughts that day? I mean, was it in your mind? Or did you? When did you know you had a chance to do that? Well, the funny thing was, it was the last day of the season, 
right? It was the first year that I had a chance to win 15 games. So I was more interested in winning my 15th game for the first time. And I think it's my third or fourth year in the big leagues, right? So I'm 24 years old and I want 15 wins. The funny thing, last day of the season in Texas, and and I know guys are ready to go home. Get on the plane and go home. Two hour plane ride, we're there, right? So I don't want to tell you what's happening the night before the last day of the season in Texas on the road. But <laughs> what happened? Well, there's a lot of noise. No, no, no. no, no. <laughs> okay, so, you so mean, I, a lot of people don't know what happened the night before that last game. I'm in bed game. early getting ready for my last start, and I hear running door hallway doors closing at two in the morning, three in the morning, guys that are- The pizza, fun. pizza and shakes, right? It must have been, it must have been. I wasn't sure what was. So I get, I'm, you know, I'm ready to go the next day and, and uh, I'm geared up and I know I know the starting lineup is ready to go. I know that some guys were on the bench that night or that day were out late. So I didn't want them in the lineup anyway. But, uh, <laughs> so, so I'm geared yeah, up. It's a day game too. It's a day game. So we're ready to go at one o'clock. You know, guys are there at the park at 10, you know, breakfast is early now and all that. Your, your timing's off, right, for, for a day game. But I'm ready to go because it's, I'm geared up. And uh, so I'm warming up and I got good stuff and I, I feel it and I'm kind of feeling nice and loosey-goosey. And, I, and, and I, I don't know what the other team's going to be like. I don't know if they're ready to go or not, but I know I'm ready. So first inning, a couple punch outs feeling pretty good about myself. Second inning, a couple more punch outs. I'm feeling good about myself, thinking that the other teams are going to lay down for me. They, they weren't laying down, believe me. They were trying. Um, and Bob Boone and I, who was my catcher that day, uh, we were just so in sync. I, I, wherever he put the glove, my, the ball was there. Whatever he called, I was in tune with what he's calling. And uh, it was a great feeling because because it, it was never a fact that I, that I felt worried about anything other than winning my game to get my 15th win. And sure enough, you know, we get in about the seventh, eighth inning, and nothing's happening. I see zeros on the scoreboard. No errors, no walks, no runs, no nothing. And that's when that's when the uh, you start puckering up a little bit. And I don't want to get into that, but um, <laughs> and everybody, so, everybody, yeah, yeah. everybody in the dugout has right. moved right. away right. from my quit. And that's <laughs> right. That's, that's, that's kind of what happens. The fans don't understand that. Tell them what happens it's, when a guy's got a chance to pitch a no-no. I mean, it's, it's the players fun. just kind of what? It's a funny thing because you'll watch the tape, and I watch it like within within a day or two. I watch the tape of the game. And the fifth inning, I'm I'm talking to people. People are sitting down next to me. Bob Boone's sitting. Hey, we got that guy. After the fourth, no, after the fifth inning, there was a there was a gap of at least three players from me on the bench. You couldn't see anybody in the picture, of the frame. <laughs> and so from the fifth inning on, nobody said a word to me. <laughs> who, scored, who scored the run? You won, you won the game one to nothing, right? One. Who scored that run? Right Boom. in. Boom. It was a great game to play, and I got to tell you, Mike was absolutely on his game, just hitting the spots like he says. Breaking ball was just unhittable, and. Uh, I got a base hit, got to second base, and Reggie Reggie Jackson drove me in with a base hit. Reggie and that was it. Run. But Doug, up. Doug had a great play, and I don't know about the fifth, maybe six. I'm not sure where it was exactly, but running, coming in, a little two chop, two high chopper. He comes in, one hands it, comes down, throwing from down under, strike. But you look at the game later on the table, you go, oh my God, that could have been the air that blew the game right <laughs> And there. you know what, I made that play, and I walked back to third base going, oh my gosh, I could have missed that ball. It would have been the no hitter, you know, and everything. Perfect game. So. With that, we got to take a break. And thanks for watching. And um, Doug, uh, in your career, you had a week that most players dream about. Twice in that week, you had three home runs in one game. I mean, that's phenomenal. That's a, that's a month for some guys. Well, you know, it, it was just one of those times where, and every player kind of gets into it, where everything kind of slows down. The ball looked like a beach ball coming to home plate. And, and I just was locked in. I mean, if the pitcher threw a breaking ball, I was hitting it. He threw a fastball in, I was hitting it. If it was, you know, um, uh, and I ended up hitting uh, 10 home runs in that week. And that, yeah, so it was, uh, it was a fun time. You were know, you the, on the, the tough on the thing road? was, no, the first one was at home. <laughs> the first thing was, was at home, and we ended up losing the game five to four. And you hit three home runs. I had, three, I had a two run <laughs> home run my first time. And the funny thing was, I, my next at bat was the very first pitch I saw, I hit it out. The next at bat, the very first pitch I saw again, I hit it out. And 
ridiculously, I came up in the bottom of the ninth inning, the hardest ball I hit, I mean literally the hardest ball I hit that day was a line drive about five feet off the ground right at the shortstop. And same they end up losing. Same pitcher, right? Same pitcher. You know, back in those days, didn't they knock guys down after they'd hit one or two? I mean, I, you know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Uh, then that's, we, that's why I asked him what was the same <laughs> I was going to say, geez. <laughs> so then we went up to Seattle after that, and Mike Moore was pitching, and you know, my first at bat, I hit a breaking ball out of right center, came back and tried to bust me in with a fastball, and hit it way out of left, and then the third time up was another pitcher, and he threw a curveball, and I hit it out. And it was just, uh, you know, it's just one of those times where everything just fell into together. I would love. I've to had, I've were you had, catching that day? No, I had, I had, I had moments like that too. And then I woke up. <laughs> You weren't yeah. in Seattle. Don't we all? <laughs> no. We all have those dreams, <laughs> but you know, for some Seattle, reason, I get bitchy. I'd have knocked him down. You'd have gone down. Sure. I, I mean, remember when, like we, were, when I, we were leaving, uh, uh, after leaving Seattle, and I remember Foley and Mock were debating that we should swing in to Las Vegas and let Doug place all the bets <laughs> because I was hotter than a pistol. Wait a minute. Now, at the beginning of your career, you replaced a legend. Yes. Brooks, Brooks Robinson, Robinson, Hall of Famer. But then at the end of your career, some upstart young punk came in. Who was that? Well, it wasn't quite my end of my year. It was my end of my year, my with career the with the Orioles. Yeah, uh, some kid that I don't know that I don't know why they thought he was going to be anything. A guy named Cal Ripken Jr. Cal Ripken but, Jr. You know, but <laughs> Jeez, geez, yeah. you know, and, and so I was the. Uh, yeah, but then you went a, to the I Angels. Was the piece and of, I, yeah, but I was the piece of baloney <laughs> between the two purebreds. <laughs> And then you came over and played in how many playoffs with the Angels? That's right. Played in two playoffs right. with the Angels, and you know we had great teams with the Angels. Yeah. I mean, that's when Mike just was coming up. And frankly, that '82 team we had, and I heard Tommy John say this, and he pitched for a lot of great teams, and, you know, pitched for you guys and everything. But he said by far the best team he ever pitched for was that '84 team. You know, we had Bob Boone behind the plate, we had Rod Carew at first, Bobby Gritch at second, oh, wow, we had yeah. Foley right. and Burleson at short. I was at third. Then we had. Downing, Freddie Lynn, Reggie Jackson in right. Our DH was Donnie Baylor. And I mean, that was four MVPs on that team and a couple of Hall of Famers. And, you know, it was, and all of us played good defense and it was great. And a lot of people don't remember, we got into the playoffs against Milwaukee that year. And at that time, it was a five game series. And we went up two games, yep. two games of nothing. And we ended up losing and three in a row and not make the World Series. Yeah, but, but real interesting, in that when we were back in Milwaukee, that's when there was a fire just like uh, going through Southern California and it was going through Anaheim Hills and Villa Park where all of us lived and we're back there in Milwaukee and our kids and families are getting evacuated and all that kind of stuff. It was kind of one of those crazy times when we dropped three in a row. With that folks, we're going to take a break. Welcome back, everybody. This is a segment we just have a lot of fun, and uh, one of the questions I've always wanted to know because I've embarrassed myself enough on a ball field. But really? Yes. A and you being you. my roommate, you should know. <laughs> what are some of you, one of your most embarrassing moments when you guys playing? Anything special? Uh, out? I, I, and this is just off the top of my head right now. I was in a game. I was, this is probably my eighth year in the big league, so I know what I'm doing out there, right? And Robin Yount hits a ball down the line with guys on base, right on the right on the chalk line, right? So I'm watching the ball go, and I'm going to be right there with the third like a baseman. Bunt. A swinging bunt. Well, it's a swinging bunt, right? Yeah. And I, okay. I get no chance of getting anybody out, so I'm going to let it go foul, right? As soon as it crosses the chalk line, I pick it up. I know it's foul. I can see it. I'm right at top. I pick it up. The umpire, the home plate umpire goes, fair ball. And I looked at him. I go, do you think I'm stupid? Do you, do you think I'm stupid? Why would I do that? He goes, I don't know, but it's fair ball. So I go, oh, man. So I give up a couple runs, and I'm just ticked off at the he comes back, I go back in, coming coming back out for the next thing. He goes, Mike, I don't think you're stupid. I really don't. But that ball was fair. I said, no, it wasn't. I, but I was asking the guy, "Are you? do you think I'm stupid? He goes, I don't think you're stupid, but it's a fair ball. <laughs> you ever won an argument against an umpire? No. no never, so. never. Okay. 
What about you? So maybe I am stupid. <laughs> did, I, did I win a fight, an argument with an umpire? Well, I don't know if I won them, but at least they heard me. <laughs> yeah, they, they, that, that's true. They, they do hear us, but they, they don't really change a call. No, they don't necessarily I think, change. I think one of what you talk about embarrassing moments, I think I can remember rolling the ball back out to the mound after two outs because I was squatting for so long, I thought there was three. And I got halfway to the dugout, and the runs were scoring, and I looked at me, and I what are you going to do? I, th I think uh, yeah, that's... I think my most embarrassing time was uh, it was in Boston and uh, we were playing and, and I don't know what happened, got caught up in the game and I'm on second base, I think I just hit a double and I'm standing on second base and I'm looking around and I start walking off the bag and sure enough, Marty Barrett's over there, I, you know, I'm thinking the pitcher's got the ball, you know, this is the big league, this hidden ball trick, throw, I'm standing there, they tag me out like I'm like 10 feet <laughs> off the bag, I'm going, what just happened? That's pretty embarrassing, trust me. Well, I had one when 72, when Dick Allen was the MVP that year, and I was hitting second, and he was hitting third, and Chuck Tanner says, I don't care what you do, but whenever you lead off, don't get picked off, because if you do, just keep going, okay? So, I, so my leads is first base, when I got on first base, were like three feet. So Allen's up, and this is, like I said, the year he was just, everything's going for him. He hits a low line drive to center field. So I get about five steps off, and I said, the center field is going to catch you. So I go back, I'm going to tag it first. I'm going to try and get the second, because it looks like they'll be pretty deep. Well, not only does it go over the center fielder's head, and not only does it go over the fence and over the bullpen, <laughs> but it goes into the center field bleachers. He's the fourth man in the history of the game ever to hit a ball in Kaminsky Park in the center field bleachers, and, and I'm tagging. tagging. And, tagging. <laughs> and he runs by, and he shoves me off the bag. <laughs> So Tanner goes, what are you doing? I said, well, you told me to stay close. <laughs> That's anyway, so I, I didn't, I, That's I didn't, so I didn't leave that down for a long time. You know, you had a, you had a show years ago with, the, with some of the baseball bloopers and stuff. Oh, and yes. The practical jokes with the pies in the face and the shaving cream on the telephones. And the, I think the time that we locked Lasorda in his room one night Ooh. in spring training, that was, that was kind of funny, too. Well, Jay, weren't you one of the first guys to actually go with, out with the grounds group? And do the field. And Jerry Royce things. and I dragged the infield the grounds crew, and Rick Mundy happened to see us out there. First of all, we didn't have the rhythm that the regular guys had. And we dragged it all the way through, and they finally realized it was us and not the regular crew, and they gave us a standing ovation. And so we come in. Now we got to go up through the stands to get back behind home plate down into the thing, right? <laughs> and here's Monty Basco, Lasorda's right hand man, going, Hey, Lasorda said, Nice job. Uh, that's a $350 fine. I said, For what? Being out of your point. I said, Hey, man, that's a lot of money. He said, Don't talk to me, talk to the skipper. So now we're still in the groundskeeper uniform. I got to go down to the groundskeeper's locker room, change back in my Dodge uniform. I'm hearing my name being called. It's the bottom of the fifth inning. We're losing one to nothing. Mark Lee, sinker ball, right-hand pitcher for the Pirates, right? They take out, uh, I think, um, I want to say it was um, uh, Bruce, uh, uh, Bert Hooten. And so we're losing one to nothing. I go up, runner first base, one out, sinker ball away, sinker ball away, one and one, slider in. I know he's going back, sinker ball. I didn't get out there. Two-run homer, stands up, we win the game two to one. So now I come in, hey, I won the game, blah, 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 blah. I said, the fine's still on. What do you mean? Fine 350 bucks, both Royce and I. So Bud Ferrillo comes in and tells all the people on KBC Radio on Sports Talk afterwards. How great. How we, much money did you get? Have we got tens and fives and twenties <laughs> for two months. Every time we'd walk in and dump it on and say, hey, Skip, thanks a lot. We got over $3,500 a piece. We had a great party, you know, for two at a team party. So yeah, it's fun. Sometimes they work out, folks. Yeah. Sometimes they do. Sometimes they don't, though, too. Yeah, that's true. With that, we'll be right back. Welcome back, folks. This part of our show is where we take Q&A from our viewers all across the country. This question is for Steve Yeager. It's from Dave in La Habra. What was it like making the greatest movie ever, Major League? Well, I did all three uh, series of Major Leagues, but I think the, the original Major Leagues, uh, David Ward was a, was a writer-director, got a hold of Dodgers, Dodgers got a hold of me, and uh, I needed to train Tom Berenger and Charlie Sheen, who was the two leading roles in it. And David, you know, he was an avid Cleveland Indians fan, so mm -hmm. he was he was from Cleveland. And we talked several times, and he said, make it look real. And at one point in time, he gave me enough authority to yell, cut. And when you're on a motion picture film, and somebody other than the AD or, or the director yeah. says cut, people look at you weird, right? So I yelled cut one time, and, and, and the, second, the first AD looked at me and said, you can't do that. I said, talk to the boss. 
talk to the boss. Boss says he can do it because we're saving tape. We're going from there. But it was great. I mean, between Charlie Sheen and Corbin Burnson and uh, Don Berenger and, and Dennis Haysberg, who has got a great series now on TV. That's right. Uh, played Serrano. Uh, there were some guys that could play. I mean, Charlie played a little bit in high school as a, as a shortstop and a pitcher. He looked like he could release yeah, the ball. He, he released the ball. We, we try to work him out like a short reliever, he, we, where I told David he could go three or four days in a row, then you got to give him a couple of days off, and he can come back from there. Uh, Dennis actually hit a ball out in the old ballpark in Milwaukee, because that's where we did some filming, too. Yep. Boom. And uh, it was fun. <laughs> it was fun. It really was. It was great. But every ball that was thrown or hit, I had something to do with it. And I tell you, it was, it was cold at the, the 3 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. 3 o'clock in the morning, standing on a 40-foot scaffold, throwing balls down like this to get that little arch, you know. It's cold up on that scaffold, I'll tell you. But it was fun. It was a great, it was a great experience for me. It was a great movie to watch. I oh, it's it. super. you got to get the R version, though. Yeah, I imagine. <laughs> I'm sure we can show that one, folks. Yeah. This one is for Doug, and it's from Lauren in Baltimore. Orioles Mezzik. Was it a special time for you and the Oriole fans? Tell us about it. Orioles Mezzik. It was, it was a real special time. Um, this was in 1979, and the team was was really starting to come together. We were playing good ball, um, and we really weren't expected to win. We were, you know, it, it was a, a younger team with some solid veterans, but we kept started coming back in late innings, and we had won a couple of games in the late innings, and then this, uh, we came up, we're playing uh, Detroit, and uh, there was about 35, 38,000 fans in the stadium, and it came to the bottom of the ninth with two outs, and nobody left the game. You know, it was it was weird. And all the fans, I walk up, and they're standing up cheering, like, "Come on, you can do it!" And they were not giving up. And t two pitches later, I hit a two-run home run, <laughs> and we won. And I got to tell you, the fans were—it was crazy. Ten minutes after the game, I got pulled back out of the clubhouse, came back out and at least 30,000 fans were still in the stands. And from that point on, it was called Oriole Magic. The next night, Eddie Murray hits a two-run home run to win the next, next night. night. And that was, from that point on, nobody left the end of the, you know, at the end of the game because we were always a team coming back. And we went on to the World Series, and unfortunately we lost in the seventh game in the eighth inning to Willie Stargell who hit a home run. But it was a great team, and that's what Oriole Magic was all about. Well, you had a lot of good players on that team, Oh, too. we had some yeah. great players. Eddie Murray, you know, that was his first year. We had Lee May, you know, Mark Belanger. It was just a great team. Kenny Singleton. Ooh, not too bad. Michael, this is from Marie in Fullerton. And aren't you a Fullerton guy, by the way? I am local born, guy. born in Fullerton. That's right. As a kid, was baseball your favorite sport? Is that what you really wanted to do growing up? Well, as a kid, I'm, I'm, if you're talking about kids being, you know, eight through 12 years old, I played every sport, football, basketball, baseball. I thought because I grew in high school to be about six, seven, which is what I am now, I thought I'd be a college basketball player. I really did. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, my junior and senior years in high school, I was a really good pitcher. I got a lot of guys out, had a good breaking ball, and I had scouts and people in my ear telling me, man, you got to play baseball. So I took that, you know, with a grain of salt. I really wanted to play basketball, I really did, but I thought I saw a better future in, in uh, baseball. But as a kid, I think, I think you develop your athletic ability by playing all different kinds of sports. Instead of, nowadays, kids are specializing yeah, I don't like playing that. baseball I don't like only. It at all. And you see a lot of Tommy John surgeries right. when, when kids are 13, 14 years old now. They, they get burned out. Yeah, they, they got get, these young well, kids playing 140 well, Mentally, too, well, they get burned yeah, out. You're right. When do yeah. they get excited about when baseball comes around if you don't get away from it Because for a it's always months. there, right? It's always yeah. there. I always look forward to baseball being over, now I'm going to go play football. Football's over. I'm going to go play basketball. basketball. I always look forward to the next That's sport. That's the way we did it. Now exactly. it doesn't happen. I look forward to those three months off we got when the season was over. <laughs> 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 I'm talking about when go, you're a kid. I when you're go, a kid. Well, but I knew it. No, I was talking as, as a player. You, your question was you as a kid. They didn't ask me. I just said, I like to go lawn bowling and things right. like that. You know, <laughs> everybody, everybody talks about your fastball, but you had a wicked curve. I mean, was oh, that really no. your out pitch? It was. It was. And I had that since I was probably nine or ten years old. My older brother, Tom it to me my dad was crazy enough to let him teach it to me and uh, but I, I i learned it the right way if you learn the wrong way to throw a curveball, you you're gonna hurt yourself so i was throwing that as a nine-year-old um developed the fastball as i got older and bigger and then all of a sudden everything came together isn't six seven intimidating enough yeah. well, <laughs> huh? and his fastball would bury in on the right yeah, that, that, so you know yeah, what that's I mean, like six, I had seven a little, little something of this nah or nah, behind you yeah yeah 
Well, folks, look at the time's already escaped us. I can't believe it. That's our show for tonight. We're glad you're here. Thanks for watching. Come back again next week.